Good morning. So glad to be with you again this morning on a beautiful, beautiful sunny day and a nice day outside. And, and so we're so glad to be with you this morning by Facebook Live to be able to give you a message of encouragement and hope. And uh, we pray that you would receive a blessing from it this morning. We have much to be thankful for. And our message is entitled, God is Good Today. We're so glad for our uh, church family to be a part of this. And we've not been able to meet, but uh, if things go well and, and the plans are to possibly meet at the church next Sunday morning uh, from 11 to 11.30 and to have a message of gathering together, but there will be many guidelines which will be going out. They're on our website now, but they'll be going out in a letter this week. And so we want you to be in prayer for that. Other churches are already starting and, and trying to phase back in. Some are only uh, going to have several services as they can only have a, a certain number of people in the, the church to make sure they're social distance. But we're glad for our church family being on this morning and others of you that, that may not be a part of the uh, Ch Grace Baptist Church, uh, but you're watching and you're uh, uh, being fed by God through uh, means by Facebook Live. So we want to open up with a word of prayer this morning. And, we just pray that you would pray there uh, as we begin to pray together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for your many blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, that you are so good and so gracious, so kind and merciful to us. We did not deserve your love. We did not deserve salvation. We did not deserve the blessings that you bestow upon us. But, dear Lord, you love us. You forgive us when we were unlovely. You love us when we were unlovely. You, you forgave us when we were sinners. Uh, you died for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you that you gave us eternal life when you died on the cross. And uh, we're just so thankful for that. We're so thankful for all the gifts and the blessings you've given to us. We thank you for our church family. We pray that you would um, bring us together and closer during this time. And, and dear Lord, that we would be the church outside of the walls uh, as we can minister to people. Uh, dear Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us in the time together, that we meet together this morning, that you would be with this message. May you uh, give me the words that, that need to be said and the thoughts and, uh, and just use my, clear my mind to, so that I'm totally focused. And dear Lord, also, I pray that you'd be with the listeners uh, as they're listening and, and dear Lord, just to help them to apply this to their life and to, to find encouragement, to comfort. Dear Lord, if someone does not know you this morning, they hear this. Uh, dear Lord, I just pray that they would become convicted and accept you as their Savior this morning and, and come to a relationship with you and know you in a personal way. Lord, we just pray for those that are sick. We know that some in our church family uh, are uh, have been in the hospital and they're now in assisted uh, living uh, re rehab. And we just pray that you would be with them. We know we're not able to visit with them, uh, but we're able to pray with, uh, with them and, and uh, to co contact them by mean, other means. Uh, but Lord, we just pray that, that you would be with them and their family as they're separated, uh, not able to be with them during this time. Uh, we pray for uh, those that are shut in in our church and that you would be with them during this uh, this virus and this time that they're not able to get out and do things and enjoy uh, the things that they need to enjoy and would like to enjoy. But Lord, we just pray that you would be with us time. We give you all the thanks and the glory and the praise for everything you do in our life and for this time that we come together this morning. We ask these things in the beautiful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to take your Bible and go into the Old Testament, Nahum. Uh, it's just a few short, if you go to Matthew, it's just a few books over uh, to the left in your Bible. But the book of Nahum, uh, in chapter 1, we want to read verses 1 through 7, and we want to preach a message entitled, God is Good. Let's begin reading in verse 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite, God is jealous, and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languishes, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. 
May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to his word this morning. You know, I used to uh, attend a church, used to, a church we used to attend. Whenever the pastor would say, God is good, the congregation would respond by saying, all the time. The pastor would then say, all the time, and the congregation would respond by saying, God is good. I want you to say that with me this morning. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. You know, in this pandemic and when bad things are happening, one can find it hard to see that God is good. But verse 7 of our text says God is good. The book of Nahum is a difficult book to read. Nahum is labeled as one of the minor prophets. The Old Testament is made up of major and minor prophets. Now, there are five major prophet books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. There are 12 minor prophet books, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The minor prophet's message is not any less important than the message of the major prophets. The label simply means that their message is shorter. Our text is found in the book that bears the name of the prophet Nahum. His name means comfort or consolation. It is a shortened form of the name Nehemiah. Now the city of Capernaum is named after Nahum. The Jews call the city Kepher Nahum or the city of Nahum. So the name Nahum, which means comfort, is a strange name for the book because the book of Nahum is a book of judgment. It is a book of harsh pronouncements of doom against a people who had abandoned the ways of God. Now, some have asked me and others if this pandemic is God's pronouncement of doom against a world that has abandoned the ways of God. I can't answer that. But the book of Nahum is a sequel to the book of Jonah. You remember the book of Jonah. About a hundred years earlier, Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh, which was the capital city of the nation of Assyria. Jonah did not want to go because he did not think that the people of Nineveh deserved to hear the gospel. Jonah disobeyed, and he went the opposite way of God's command. And when the storm came, it was because of Jonah's disobedience. So they threw Jonah overboard, and he landed in the mouth of a great fish where God could get his attention. I, I think this pandemic has gotten our attention. And when the great fish spewed him out of its mouth to the dry land, Jonah then went to Nineveh. He entered their city, preaching a message of certain impending judgment. And when the Ninevites heard the message of Jonah, they repented of their sins, and the Lord spared the city. A century had passed, and they had turned away from their commitment that they made to God during that time. By the time the book of Nahum was written, the Assyrian Empire was at the height of its military and national power. They were on the march. So they were seeking to expand their boundaries of their kingdom. And during this time, the Assyrians were guilty of attacking the nation of Israel. Even though God was using them to punish Israel for their sins, they attacked the city. Now God was going to punish Assyria for their disobedience and their hatred of the people of God and because they did not follow through with their commitment. Nahum's message is one of judgment. And in verse 1, Nahum refers to his message as a burden. The word burden means heavy. His message is a heavy burden because it is a message of doom, gloom, and judgment. The way to determine if a prophet was fully, really of God, is determined by whether their prophecies come true. Nahum's prophecies were fulfilled when God uh, allowed the Assyrians to be conquered by the Babylonians in 612 B.C. While Nahum's message is one of judgment and wrath, there is a bright spot in verse 7. In the midst of the message of wrath, anger, gloom, and doom, verse 7 is a beacon of hope in a dark and a stormy night. In the midst of this pandemic and all the fear, the worry, and the anxiety that it has caused, this verse is a message of hope to every child of God. I want you to notice three reasons we can, be, we can confidently say that God is good. First of all, there is the assurance of God. The assurance of God. Even with all that was happening in the days of Nahum, Nahum clearly says, the Lord is good. Even with everything that is happening during the last 11 church, uh, weeks that churches have not been able to assemble, the Lord is good. 
Nahum makes this statement against the backdrop of God's judgment on the Assyrians as we look in verses 2 through 6. This should encourage us. As a nation, like the Assyrians, we have wandered away from God. The Assyrians, it's told that they were the vilest, meanest, meanest people uh, of the time, at that time. But in reality, they were not as, as vile or evil than most of the people in America or our nation today. We have reviled God's law. We have ignored God's word. We have removed prayer from our lives. We have said church is not important. We have gone our own way. We have found countless ways to remove God from our lives and replace it with other things. And as a result, America is a nation under judgment today. The turmoil in our society, the upheaval in our economy, the steady decline in our morality, and the coronavirus can all be traced to our abandonment of God. Even in the midst of judgment, the Lord is good. Even in the midst of a pandemic, the Lord is good. Circumstances may say otherwise, but the Lord is good. Regardless of what is happening in life related to finances, government, people, pain, problems, sickness, or even death, the Lord is good. We are living in difficult times, but the Lord is good. He is good to all people in all places, in all situations, and at all times. Psalm 145 verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. In spite of how things look or how we feel, the Lord is good. That is the assurance that we have in all situations and circumstances of life. It is a fact the Lord is good. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 135 verse 3 says, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. All these verses and many others teach us the same truth, which is that the Lord is good. Romans 8, 28 reminds us so, as it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are, are called uh, uh, and to the called according to his purpose. It is easy to say the Lord is good when life is going well, but the fact doesn't change the Lord is good. The McCamies has a song which says, Life is easy when you're up on the mountain, and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, for you're never alone. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he will make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain. But talk comes so easy when life's at its best. Now it's down in the valleys of trials and temptations. That's where your faith is really put to the test. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. The Lord is good even when times are bad. The Lord is good all the time and in every way. The word of God declares the greatness of God. But one word that best describes his unchanging nature is the word good. The Lord is good. And that is the fact that I want us to get from this message. But the second thing that I want you to see is the assistance of God. Nathan reminds the discouraged and downheartened people of God that God is a stronghold in the day of trouble. The word stronghold means a place of safety, a place of protection, a place of refuge, a safe harbor in the storm. And I like that, don't you? Why do we need a stronghold? Trouble has come to us now in the form of pandemic. But the reality is that even if there was not a pandemic, trouble will come to us in this life. The word trouble refers to anything that distresses us. It speaks of those times when life closes in around us and the pressures of life come against us. In those times, the people of God need to have a refuge. Psalm 73 verse 1 says, Truly God is good to Israel even to such are of a clean heart. 
And Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Psalm 27, verse 5 says, For in the day of trouble, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Proverbs 18, 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and is safe. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. We have a place we can flee in the time of trouble. We have a place where the hurts and the pains of life cannot follow us. There is a place of safety for the peace of God, and that's in his arms. There is an interesting word, though, in verse 2, and it is the word jealous. When a person becomes jealous, it is because they are afraid of losing something or someone that is dear to them. It is a manifestation of our fallen nature, and it is a sin. We know that God does not sin, so what does this word mean when it refers to God? God is not afraid of losing us. He's not afraid of losing the battle. And he's not afraid of losing this world because he created it and he sustains it. But it means that God views us as a precious possession. 1 Peter 2.9 says, We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you shall show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. Another translation says that we are a precious people. God places himself between us and any person or any event that would harm us. Let me illustrate it this way. Imagine taking your child to the zoo, and while you are there, a lion escapes from the cage. You would do everything in your power to place yourself between your child and the lion. But why? Because you are jealous over that child. That child is a precious possession to you. And you would pay any price for them, even laying down your life to protect them. That is the way it is with God. His children are precious to him. And let me say this, as we sing that song, Jesus Loved Me, red and yellow, black and white are precious in his sight. And what is going on in our nation is a sad indictment of, of many people. That, yes, something bad has happened, but it, it would be no different than if it was a, if, if it was a white man who was on a black, uh, a, a white man who was, had his knee on a white person. They, they, they died, and that's wrong. But that doesn't mean that we need to, uh, to, to, to react the way we have reacted. We need to take our burdens to the Lord, and we need to, to protest in a way that, or, or say things in a way that would be helpful to mankind and not hurtful. But we say that God protects us. We are precious to him. His children are precious to him, and he will do whatever it takes to protect them. God is on the throne and in control and will not let the events or circumstances overwhelm you. In verse 3, it declares that he has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. These words remind us that he is in control. Our God is a sovereign God, and the winds and the waves obey his will. When the storms of life rise against you, when the winds of adversity buffet you, then you will discover that there is a place of refuge for the child of God that's in his arms. You will discover there is peace in the midst of a storm. You will discover that God is directing your path for his glory, and this crisis is for our good and for his glory. We need to learn the truth that even when we cannot see the way, he is the way. But thirdly, I want you to see this morning that there is the, the third reason is the acknowledgement of God. Notice in verse 7, he knoweth them that trust in him. The word knoweth means to know intimately, to know by experience. The word trust means to put your complete confidence in. The words he knoweth them reminds us that God knows his children. He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows what you are facing. He knows every detail of your life. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows you intimately. He knows you completely. There is nothing about you. you. There is nothing about your life or your situation that has escaped his eye or his attention. 
When Hagar, Hagar fled from Abraham, God saw her. When Jacob was running from Esau, God saw him. When Moses was going through a low time in the backside of the desert in his life, God saw him. When Job lost it all, God saw, saw him. When Joseph was, was put in the pit and then taken to prison, God saw him. When Elijah was de de depressed and in hiding, God saw him. When David was going through the valley of the shadow of death, God saw him. When Paul was in a dark dungeon, God saw him. When John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, God saw him. God knows you and everything about you and what you're going through. He knows his sheep intimately. Uh, in John chapter 10, verse 14, the Bible says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. The 23rd Psalm declares the depths of his knowledge and comprehensiveness of his children when he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Not only does he know us, but the sheep know him. John 10 verses 4 and 5 say, says, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. John 10 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. His sheep know his voice. And when he speaks, they respond to his words. The sheep and the shepherd are in constant communication. While sheep are, are dumb and defenseless and even directionless, we are more than sheep. We are his friends. John chapter 15, verses 13 through 15 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Yes, we're sheep, but we are called his friends. The word friend means an associate, and this means he associates with us. We are his friends. Uh, they say that you are known by the company you keep, and being a friend of God means that you are in good company. We are not only sheep as he is a shepherd to his sheep. We are not only his friends as he associates with us. But Hebrews chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 tells us that we are his brethren. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. The word refers to those of the same womb. We are the family of God. By the process of the new birth, we become a child of God, and God is our Father. And then Christ is our elder brother, and we are heirs to God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So see, he is more than a leader of a bunch of sheep. He is more than a friend to a group of sinners. He has saved us by his grace and adopted us into his family, and he is our heavenly Father. There is an acquaintance. There is an awareness, there is an acknowledgement from God that gives us hope in the day of trouble that we are facing. Remember, God is good. He is a stronghold, and he knows you. One day, a teenage boy was telling his grandmother how everything in his life was going wrong. It was just terrible, he was telling her. He told her about his problems at school. He told her about his problems with family and friends and his parents. And as he was telling these things, she was baking a cake. She asked him if he would like a snack, and he said, Yes, Grandmother. Here, have some cooking oil, Grandma offered, to, to which he said, Yuck. How about a couple of raw eggs, Grandma asked, to which he said, That's gross. Would you like some flour or maybe some baking soda, to which he said, That's awful. The boy said that all of those things that she mentioned are terrible, to which the grandmother replied, Yes, all those things seem by themselves, seems bad by themselves. But when they are put together in the right way, they make a delicious cake. God works the same way. Many times we wonder why he would let us go through such bad and difficult times. Like the boy, we say, this is yucky. <coughs> Excuse me, this is gross. This is awful. This is terrible. Why am I going through this? But as we trust God, despite the circumstances, eventually, together, all things will make something wonderful and glorious. That's why we can say, the Lord is good. As we conclude this morning, I want to, uh, a song came to mind as we were 
preparing this message and I just thought it was fitting and I finally found a video and you can have the lyrics are there you can sing along with it you can listen to it enjoy it then we'll come back to close with a word of prayer Well, I hope you get the uh, the message from that song and the message that we have shared with you this morning. God is good. And I pray that we know this even better uh, now that we went through this pandemic and we're going through this crisis in our, our world and in our own lives. Let's pray and close with a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, Holy God, we thank you for this time that we can share you with. We thank your word. We thank you that you are good. And, and this verse is so relevant. You are good, you are a stronghold, and you know us in an intimate way. And we thank you for that comfort and encouragement. I pray that if there's someone that has heard this that does not know you, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, and they would turn their life over to you today. I pray for all of us that are the family of God, that we found a source of comfort and encouragement from this little book of Nahum, and dear Lord, that we would draw closer to you in the days ahead. I pray that you would be with us, watch over, and care for us 
And we love you. We'll give you all the praise and glory for all that you're doing now and all that you're going to do in the future. Amen.